We have um, a conversation between uh, Rush Roberts, who is going to moderate this, from the Hoover Institute at Stanford University. And Professor Robert Barrow from Harvard, who I've been trying and trying and trying to get to come to our seminar to teach. And uh, he's a very busy guy. He told me, the first time I asked, he said he wanted to come. But I kept on asking. You know, I was, uh, so, someone uh, told me that when somebody says no, that means I want to talk to you some more. I want more information. So uh, we, don't, we don't take no for an answer. And uh, so we finally succeeded. And Professor Barrow is, is here. He's teaching the seminar. He's participating. And then a couple months ago, I was uh, dominating Minka around the corner uh, from where I live, and I saw a familiar face. Turned out it was Avi Weiss, who, uh, who spoke here about a year ago and was great. So I said, you know, you were really great two years ago. And I said, yeah. No, really. <laughs> <laughs> I said, you were really great last time. You want to come back? And he said, sure. So uh, Abby Weiss is uh, chairman of the Taub Center for so 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 Social Economic Studies. Social, social Economic Studies in Israel. Okay? They, they produce beautiful studies, well done. I love to read them. I learned a lot about Israel. So uh, the topic is can government influence economic growth? So I'm, I'm interested in finding out if, if government can indeed do that. So let me invite our speakers to uh, share their thoughts about this. It's great to be here, and I want to say how great it is to see a lot of former students here. I see some of you at a distance, and um, if you're one of my alums, if you've come to one of the spring uh, seminars, please say hello after this uh, conversation, because we'll have some time uh, afterward. Uh, we're going to talk for a little while, maybe 40, 45 minutes, uh, about the Israeli economy. And then we're, if we have time, we're going to also open it up to questions and answers from the, from the crowd. So uh, if you have thoughts, uh, you can start preparing them. I want to start with a piece that Robert Barrow had in the Wall Street Journal recently making some suggestions for U.S. policy to increase growth in the United States. Growth in the United States <clears throat> since the Great Recession has been very disappointing. And even though we haven't had another recession, uh, the growth rates have been quite low relative to past recoveries. And so Robert laid out an agenda for a um, hypothetical president. We happen to have one. His name is President Trump. And Robert made his suggestions. And Robert, I'd like you to start by telling us what you think would be good for the United States economy to start with, and then we'll move on to Israel. Of course, there's a lot of uncertainty about what's going to come out of the Trump administration in the United States. Uh, I laid out a package of things uh, that I thought would be positive. Uh, I think it is a time of great opportunity in the sense that there is a good chance that the package of policies that appear will be uh, very positive. But there's also uh, risk of things on the other side. Uh, so things I thought could be positive, first was a, a fiscal package, uh, including cuts in corporate income tax rates and probably cuts in individual income tax rates balanced by uh, changes in deductions so that you make up a lot of the revenue there. Um, I estimated what I thought that could contribute to growth in terms of what I knew from some empirical evidence. Um, and that, I thought, could be contributing substantially. The particular estimate I had was adding a half a percent per year in economic growth. Um, the corporate tax part, which I had less evidence on, I thought could actually be more positive, and it's something I'm currently working on in terms of research uh, across countries trying to assess the impact there. I thought there could be some important changes in terms of regulatory reform. Uh, that's gotten worse in the U.S. over the last uh, 10 years or so, and there are important areas where I think that could be positive. I tried to use evidence in particular based on the World Bank's measure of ease of doing business as to what the potential would be for economic growth from that source. 
And that could also contribute something on the order of 0.3 to 0.5 percent per year in terms of economic growth if done properly. Uh, by the way, I looked up the numbers uh, for Israel from the World Bank, and that environment's gotten worse since 2010 than it used to be. And it's sort of the sense you have of uh, looking around at things in Israel that the regulatory burden seems to be a substantial problem, uh, much more so actually than in, in the United, uh, United States. Uh, there's talk about a big infrastructure uh, investment package in the U.S. Um, there's potential there, I think, for positive impacts on productivity, particularly in terms of things related to transportation networks. But there's also a danger of going too far and having projects that aren't really productive and also putting a big uh, increase on the fiscal burden. I thought the biggest uh, potential downside in the U.S. context was in terms of uh, uh, international openness, things that would look like protectionism for trade and related to that would be restrictions on immigration. Uh, so that I thought is the biggest danger actually in terms of a downside. Um, and one thing I observed in the, in the column, there's a lot of talk about a border adjustment tax uh, in the U.S. Uh, almost all countries have a value added tax as a major source of revenue. And it's a very efficient form of uh, uh, taxation. Uh, it does include a kind of border adjustment as part of it. Uh, the situation in the U.S. would be that politically, it didn't seem like it was feasible for Republicans to be re recommending a value-added tax. So instead of that, they were uh, uh, advising putting in this border adjustment levy, which is kind of one part of a, that system. Um, I thought maybe a little bit cynically that this could actually be a positive part of the fiscal package in the U.S. because it, it would raise a certain amount of revenue and it would let the president say he was being protectionist because it would include something that looks like a tax on imports. But he wouldn't actually be being protectionist because it has an offsetting subsidy on exports, which at least in terms of economic theory should mostly neutralize the effects on international trade. So I thought you could have it both ways in terms of Trump saying, well, here I was protectionist as I promised, but I'm not re it'll turn out not to really be so, so it might not compromise economic growth. But I think that's an area of, of big danger for the U.S. So Avi, uh, tell us about the potential of those kind of changes in Israel. Cuts in, putting aside the protectionist part, the restrictions on imports, uh, what's the potential for tax cuts of those kinds and maybe infrastructure spending? Do you think that would be helpful to the Israeli economy? Um, well, tax cuts uh, certainly tend to stimulate the economy in general. Uh, it's pretty, pretty much true any place. In Israel, the uh, income tax, um, the way income tax is set up is it has a much longer runway than it does in the United States. So you can actually over 50% of the working uh, for, workforce is basically paying no income taxes at all. And it's really just the uh, afterwards when it really starts taking off really quickly, quickly you get up to 48% uh, pretty quickly once you've passed that, that, uh, that level. And uh, tax, tax cuts at the top of the at the top end of the, over there, and again, getting the revenue back from increasing taxes, let's say at the lower end or from other places, uh, could certainly have an effect. Corporate taxes are about 25 percent in Israel. Cut those down; it's a lot higher than it is of countries that are importing into Israel, and therefore that puts um, the Israeli producers at at a at a disadvantage. If you were to cut those, you'd be able to stimulate the economy to some, to some extent. So I think t tax cuts are always something that are good, but you have to remember this, the following. When you're thinking about Israel you, and, and comparing it to the United States, Israel views itself to a very large extent as a welfare state. And um, you know, whether it is or not is another question, but certainly it's more of a welfare state than the United States is, and that's where, it's, where it's, it starts from. And Israelis very much like to compare themselves and to like to compare, to, uh, to compare the performance of the Israeli economy to the Scandinavian countries, for instance. Now, when you compare the tax rates inside of Israel compared to the Scandinavian countries, you're going to find the taxes in Israel are um, about 30%. The average tax of all taxes collected is about 30% of, of uh, GDP. In the average uh, OECD country, is about 36 to 37%. In the United States, it's lower. It's about 25, 26%. But Israel is actually, with respect to its tax collections, is on the low side of the, of the scale. So when you start, and, and this all happened, by the way, it started in 2008, when there were very, very major tax cuts. 
and, and it did stimulate the economy, then the question is, if you want to, to some extent, if you want to, remain some type of a welfare state, you want to give uh, health, you want to give education, etc. if that's what you want to do, then there's a limit to how much you can cut taxes, because it's going to hit you on the other side. Um, that's that. You want to do infrastructure? Talk also, about let, talk about let me refer to you doing your... Uh, let, me, let me say one thing on the Scandinavian uh, countries. It, it's actually quite remarkable how they're able to generate something like 50% of the GDP going through the government and have very generous uh, welfare benefits without completely compromising the uh, economic uh, strength of, of, of those places. Um, I think part of the reason for that is, of course, they have the value-added tax is important, and that's probably the most important, uh, most uh, efficient form of taxation that's available, and it's used by a lot of countries. Also, aside from having taxes, which they have to have to finance the government, those countries are pretty liberal otherwise. They don't kind of mess up labor markets, for example, and other things. So the combination of that with relatively efficient taxation seems to work to generate a surprisingly large amount of revenue going through the public sector without completely compromising economic growth. Yeah, that's, cor that's correct. Um, going back to the ease of doing business that you mentioned, you know, in your article you, you um, talk about the fact that the U.S. fell from third in the world to eighth in the world. Israel's at 52nd in the world. Okay, so if you're just comparing with respect to what you could gain in the United States by improving the regulatory situation in Israel, you could actually really, really improve things uh, significantly. So that's a major problem. With respect to infrastructure... Israel was actually number 29 in 2010. And now it's 51. 52nd. Okay. I, well, I have 52 in my numbers, but okay. We're not going to argue about it. But I'm saying there was a big. Uh, I've got a full deck. You've got a I think, was, I think they were 51.7. <laughs> so if you're rounding up, it's 52. The more important <laughs> point is it's gotten worse than it was in 2010. It, it's gotten much worse than it was. And, and the bureaucracy, in order to be able to open a business, in order to be able to build a building, um, to get the permits necessary for it, is really very, very difficult. It's not just that there's a lot of bureaucracies, that you have to go through a lot of different offices until you actually get what you need, which means it's not one place, it's not a one-stop shop, you can go and get everything done. There's a lot of bureaucracy involved in order to get anywhere. Uh, infrastructure is, is a very big problem inside of Israel. Um, and uh, in particular, you talk about transportation. Israel has, I think, from what I saw, People wait. Uh, people are, are stuck in traffic in Israel more than any other country with respect to the amount of time it takes to get to work. It's, it takes an amazing amount of time. I come into Jerusalem every morning, and I, I don't want to tell you how long it takes me. I'm coming from 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 from, from Petah Tikva to Jerusalem, and it's taking me an hour and a half to get there. It should be taking 45 minutes, and that's because of of, of the backup. Uh, there's a lot of investment going on in infrastructure, but not nearly enough. And it's, and uh, and with the with the um, growing economy, people are buying a lot of cars, people own a lot of cars, and there's an incredible amount of traffic. And the problem is that the public transportation uh, system isn't up to snuff. It's not just not good enough. So they're building the, the, the fast train from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, which could have a big, a, a big uh, effect. It's expected to be finished next year. I don't know if it will or it won't be, but it's expected to be finished next year. That could have an effect, but we're going to see. But we always seem to be racing after our own uh, tails. You finish, you expand the road by one more lane, and by the time you finish it, you need to do it again by another lane because it's just not enough uh, keeping up with the growth. So infrastructure, not just in transportation, but particularly in transportation, is super important. So Russ Roberts told me a little while ago that it takes 13 years typically to finish a building in Israel. And I think he was including housing as part of that. Is that a true fact? I don't know about housing. I, I wasn't sure. What do we know about that, Bobby? That, that, that's, that, that's an extreme measure. Um, that, that, that's a, that, that is a figure that's out there. It's taking 13 years to start a project until you, from the point you start until you finish. But that takes you all the way to the extreme with the, with, the, with the most difficult types of cases. It's usually not nearly that long, but it is very long. The bureaucracy is long. You have to wait a long time until you're, until you're able to get on the ground. It can take a number of years until you're actually able to do it. Uh, Israelis, because of the infrastructure situation, are still building in the old ways. We're still pouring cement in, in, in ways that were done you know, when the country was started. And that, that makes the entire process of building itself slow. And until you get through all the regulation, it takes a long time. It's difficult. So let's talk about the ease of doing business. Obviously, the World Bank measure that you mentioned, Robert, is it's a measure. It's, it's crude. It's not perfect. It tells you something. 
going from 29th to 51st doesn't mean it's almost twice as bad. We have no exact idea exactly what it means, but it's not good. We know that. I think the challenge, especially for the people in the seminar who are going to have, we hope, start businesses, build buildings, do real things out of the world, how do you move forward an agenda? Start with Avi. How do we move forward in, in, in making a dent in that problem? What, what's your diagnosis? One way to think about it is what's the, what's the single thing you might try to achieve first, but more systemically, how can you make Israel a more streamlined place for activity, the ways we work with one another in business or uh, in, in other ways? But what I think the most important step is put all the regulatory steps into the hands of one regulator. Have one group that is responsible for the entire process from the beginning to the end and have them make sure they can get everything done. Because that way at least there's one building you go to each time. Right, with the, right? That, that, that does save on some of the transaction costs and the uncertainty about where, because I assume part of the delay is you don't even know what you need to get before you can finish, right? You know, even when we wanted to finish our, our, our apartment, we had to, to go to the, to, the, um, to, the fi to the fire station in order to get an okay uh, to check that. We had to go to, to I mean, there were, there, were, there were like 12 different places we had to go in order to get there okay just to actually go in and move into an apartment that was finished. And, and the amount of time it takes is just unbelievable. So one thing I wanted to understand better was about the land ownership uh, in Israel. Because I saw this number that over 90% of the land was uh, publicly owned. And you know, if I think of uh, cases around the world, there are some places that seem to do OK where the government owns all the land, uh, like Hong Kong and uh, maybe Singapore is like that. Uh, they have these really long leases. Um, I would have thought in terms of private property that it would be a be better idea for the government to be selling off a lot of the land uh, that it owns. Uh, it might also be a very nice source of revenue. Uh, this was a big deal in the US when it was expanding westward and the government acquired a lot of land but then gradually sold it off and that was a big source of uh, fiscal financing uh, for a long time in the US. But I don't know enough about the Israeli situation in this regard. So, so the numbers you're saying are right. In other words, it is somewhere around 90% that's owned by the by the Israel Land Authority. And um, but but it's but but that's a misleading number because if you actually were to take a look at let's say the Tel Aviv area, the center of the country, the amount of land they actually have there in order to be able to build on is relatively small uh, because most of it is developed and and a very very large portion is in private hands. If you go to the areas that are not built up, well, that's all the Israel Land Authority. So you know, but that's not land that people are building on. So, so therefore, the number 90% is 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 very very misleading number. But it is an awful lot, and they were over the years selling off, but much too slowly. And then there was a decision for a period from about 2006, 2008, to, 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 to until about 2010, 11. There was a decision not to sell lands in the center of the country, not to allow development in the center of the country, because the goal was to develop the periphery. And they, they, therefore, they were selling off land in the periphery, but the problem was nobody wanted to live in the periphery. And nobody wanted to live in the periphery because the infrastructure was no good. And because you didn't have good schooling, you didn't have good, good uh, places to work there, and therefore, you're going to go and live in a city like Beersheba, which is a wonderful city, but at the time, you didn't have a really good trade transportation there. The roads were completely awful. And, uh, and therefore, nobody wanted to go live there. So the young people who were growing up and starting families and wanted a place to live, well, they wanted to be near some place they could work. So they also want, all wanted to be in the center of the country. Well, they're not building in the center of the country, so we're going to get to your housing pretty soon. Yeah, let's get to it now. <laughs> so let's start with a survey of the people in the room under the age of, say, 33. So if you're under the age of 33, would you like to own a house sometime in the next 10 years? If yes, raise your hand. Okay, put them down. How many of you think you'll be able to buy a house by the age of, in the next 10 years? A smaller number. So what I hear also uh, anecdotally, and I think in terms of evidence of housing prices, it's very hard, especially for young people, to buy houses these days. And uh, that's not a good thing for a lot of different reasons. And of course, it's a very important political issue that gets a lot of attention. I'm sure some of the solutions that are proposed maybe are not so effective. So I wanted to ask Avi uh, what might be done to make that problem better. Is that, in other words, more accurately, is there a cause of that problem that is 
natural, uh, excuse me, that's policy rather than just supply and demand that's being mistakenly designed and we can improve on. Well, there's no question that uh, it was caused by, uh, by policy um, that together with supply and demand. I mean, supply and demand is what caused the prices to go up, but it was that freeze over a fairly long period uh, with, which, which meant that the number of units you needed to increase every year, just the demand kept going up like crazy. What, what kind of freeze? Um, there was, as I said, there was a decision in, in the mid-2000s to stop releasing lands in the middle of the country. And that's where all the demand was. Now, this, the second thing that happened, so, so supply was, so demand was growing just because of natural growth. And supply was not moving anywhere. And when demand goes up and supply goes, you know, doesn't move, well, I think I don't have to explain to anybody in this room what happens in that case. Um, the other thing that happened is that so interest rates were supply, supply of land was the crucial constraining factor with regard to housing? Yeah, it was. Oh, yeah, very much. Uh, the other part that happened is that interest rates in Israel were very low, and people were looking for an investment. Now, since, since housing prices in Israel tend to always go up, people feel this is a very safe investment. People started putting in a lot of money into housing, so demand went up even more, and supply still wasn't going anywhere. So what's the answer? You know, the answer is supply, supply, supply. That is the answer. And it's happening. And it's happening more and more, but it's still going to take a little bit longer. Because, you know, look, there's, there's a, a large army base right across from, my, from where I live, uh, a, the Sirkin base. They're going to be building 12,000 housing units there. They just today signed the contracts or, or to, sign, to, to build 17,000 uni units in Beit Shemesh, which is a little bit further away. There, uh, there, there's the Galilot area, which is, being, uh, which is going to be uh, heavily built up. I don't know how many units are going to be there yet, but, but, but this is all going to take time. It's going to take more time than it might take elsewhere because of all that bureaucracy, but they're trying to push this forward, to push forward the, uh, uh, this thing. The, the, the plans that they have in place of, of, uh, of trying to give subsidized housing, et cetera, you know, that's a band-aid to some extent. You've got to get the supply up. If you get the supply up, the prices are going to go down, or at least you're not, they're not stop going up. Uh, you don't do that, it's not going to happen. So when we think about different ways to improve the regulatory landscape and reduce the, say, barriers to putting up a house or building quickly or doing a opening a business, you made a suggestion, at least we'll have one person in charge. Of course, all the, right now we have a lot of people in charge and they like it that way, right? <laughs> That's a good deal for them. So it's hard to understand the path to a better situation Right? Who's going to have the courage to fight that fight? Who's going to spend the political capital that it's going to take? Uh, and uh, what can citizens do who are passionate about this perhaps to make a difference? Because obviously the natural incentives that are there in place are going to keep the status quo the way it is. And we just are then going to accept the fact that Israel is handicapped by the fact that they started off with a really Kafkaesque, labyrinthine, complex regulatory set of red tape, and that's too bad. I find that depressing, and I assume you do too. Anything we can do about that? You know, this issue about uh, dealing with kind of one regulator, these are just some thoughts. It's a little surprising that a kind of monopoly regulator is the best way <laughs> to do this. Now, my colleague Andre Schleifer uh, have examples related to corruption. So if you want to think, for example, about getting a passport or a driver's license, it's really good if you can get that from a lot of different government offices, rather than having a single government office where you would go to get that kind of uh, approval or license. But I guess if it's a situation where you're doing a house and you, ne you need 15 different things, then you run into the situation that you described, where you have to run around to all these uh, different places. So it's not a matter of having 15 different offices from which you can get one thing that you need. So, but there must be some kind of a trade-off where uh, it's not always clear that a monopoly the regulator is gonna produce better outcomes, but I can understand what you were saying. Well, well I think you're, you're, what you're not thinking about um, in, in that argument is that you're comparing you know, one monopolist to 15 regulate to 15 competitors, it's actually, you should compare one monopolist to 15 monopolists. No. <laughs> because every one of them is the only one that can give you an okay in that specific field. No, that's right. you can I go wherever that. you want. <laughs> right. Um, so, given this reality right now at least, it raises an interesting question, which is, sounds bleak, and yet the Israeli economy doing pretty well. 
growing, growing at a rate that's better than the United States. Uh, its high tech sector is the envy of the world. And uh, is that misleading? Is that covering up? Is the success of the high tech sector misleading as to what's going on? Or is the glass half full? The glass is, uh, is about 8% full. How much? 8%. 8% is okay, I'll, I'll explain that much. I'll explain that, <laughs> that number to you. Um, yes, it, it's misleading. It's misleading. Look, the Israeli high-tech industry is incredible. It's unbelievable how successful it's been and how much it's, uh, it's given to, the, to, to Israel in general, uh, in the way it's viewed, in the way it, it works. It's really, really wonderful. But about, only about 8% of, uh, of the population of the working force is working in the high-tech industry. The rest, the other 92% are working not in the high-tech industry. And the problem is that since about 1995, when Israel started investing very, very heavily in industry, uh, not, just, not just government investment, but private investment also, it's pretty, it's pretty much all gone into high-tech. And the result is that the rest of the economy has been left to, to, uh, to, to its own. And it's really been very, very much harmed. Um, what I'm referring to is productivity. Productivity in the high-tech sector in Israel, productivity basically means the value per, per hour work. And what productivity inside of Israel is, um, is in the high-tech industry, has gone up faster than in almost any other country. And, and the 8% that I told you is actually a larger percentage than in any other developed country. It's an incredibly, incredibly large number. But for the rest of the economy, productivity hasn't been going anywhere. And in fact, in the 90s, it actually went down significantly and then started very, very slowly creeping back up to where it was. But there's been basically no productivity growth inside of the Israeli economy, uh, except for in the high tech. So, so it is covering that up. Now, if you were to take a look at actually at, at what's happening to growth over time, this year was, was really an exceptional year. And the 4% figure is, was a completely unexpected figure. When it came out of, uh, about a month ago, everybody was completely shocked by the, by, by the number. And the reason is that uh, if you take a look at the history of growth over the past couple of decades, so until about seven years ago, uh, GDP per, cap per capita was growing at about 2% a year. That's a really good rate, per capita growth of 2%. It's nice, especially since Israel is expanding uh, in, in its uh, population. For the past seven years or so, it's been about 1% a year on average. And this 4% now, uh, well, it's not 4% per capita, it's only 2% per capita, but that's still bringing you back to a place that you haven't been in a while. And the question is, how long is it going to last? And when you want to think about how long it's going to last, now you've got to start looking at what is it that, where is the growth coming from? And can we sustain that? Is that something that will continue into the future? The, the outlook doesn't look, uh, I, 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 hope the free, I hope that you're right, uh, Bob. I hope you're getting, you're, we're going to be getting ourselves to 6% this year. And, uh, and, I, and, and I will I'll completely say that it's because of, of, of the Institute. And, that, and I think that's great. Um, but the, but the, um, the way people are looking at it, they're looking more at, at um, over the next number of years, at 1%, uh, not looking at, at, at the 6% or 4%. The perspective I had on Israel going back a long time, so more, more than 25 years ago, was it was really surprising how poor the country was, given all the human capital that was here. So it seemed to be a place uh, if you go back into the 70s and 80s, that you would have thought this should be a much richer place. And it's basically being constrained by socialism. That's what I used to think about the Israeli economy. Now, if you start from there, and you could also tell this story in a more extreme form about China. If you start from that situation, and then you open up to some extent, and you allow for more business activity, and you're less serious about socialism than you used to be, then I think you can get a lot of economic growth and you can get some convergence toward richer places. And I think that's kind of the story that fits with Israel. Uh, so for example, I looked at a group of economies which I thought about as convergence success stories. And if you look, say, since 1990, uh, uh, for Israel, the growth rate per capita, I calculated over that period, 1990 to 2014, was almost 3% per year, actually, per capita. It was something like 2.8 or uh, something like that. And the average growth rate per capita, if you look at a lot of countries over the long term, is about 2%. So 2.8 was a lot higher than that average. And that was enough to make uh, Israel over, uh, let's say, 25 years into a much richer place where, where, it, where it is today. 
And I think to go a lot further, it has to do more in terms of opening up the economy to the market. Uh, uh, we talked about regulatory burden in particular, and that seems to be an important dimension, uh, calling for more action. In terms of productivity, uh, there's a worldwide issue, certainly in the United States, the productivity has slowed down a lot. Uh, I've heard people say, well, sometimes it goes up, sometimes it goes down, and you can't really know. Robert, what do you uh, say about, let's start with the United States, and then obviously you can talk about Israel. What's the potential to increase how much workers or an hour of a person's work contributes, especially outside the tech set, the tech uh, sector, which is also a bright spot in the United States over the last 20, 20 years or so. You know, there was an interval uh, roughly from the early 1990s through about 2006 where productivity growth was very strong in the U.S. Uh, and then it looked like that was sort of finally getting the payoff from the computer revolution that seemed to have been delayed for some reason. And then sometime after 2006, but it's a little confusing because of the Great Recession that appears soon after that, sometime after 2006, but certainly after 2010, there was a big slowdown in productivity growth in the US. So if you look at uh, output per worker or per worker hour from 2010 until uh, currently in the US, uh, the growth rate is essentially zero. The productivity growth rate has been zero over that uh, uh, period. Uh, so there's some research trying to say, well, what's the reason for that? Uh, now, frankly, it's difficult to isolate uh, something convincingly in, uh, in a statistical manner over a time span that's only six or seven years. You really can't be uh, sure about that. Uh, I think the increased regulatory burden was uh, part of the story there. I think some of the reactions to the Great Recession. Uh, in the US, the biggest reaction from the government to the Great Recession was a big increase in federal transfers, uh, which have basically remained high, uh, higher than they used to be uh, in most uh, instances. I thought there were a number of elements of the policy put in place uh, after 2008, which plausibly contributed to the slowdown in, in productivity. But you really can't be sure about that for a period of that length for one country. And that's why, as in most of my research, if I'm trying to think about what is the effect of regulations on economic growth, I think you get a lot more information about that question by looking at lots of countries over longer time periods and trying to tease out more regular patterns than you can get just by looking at one country over six or seven years. Abby. Um, what's the potential of the of, uh, of growth? I think, do I think productivity can increase? I think productivity can, can increase. I think uh, investment, um, is certainly in infrastructure, will be something that would allow you to, to, to move that up because I think that's a huge cost. Um, you know, how fast is that going to happen? I don't know. I mean, the high tech industry is doing fantastic. We've got to get it down down uh, down low. You know, getting helping helping out. Let, let's say. You know, the, the Israeli government gives a lot of tax breaks to firms. You know, Intel just built this huge plant in in Kiryat in Kiryat which is which is going to have a huge effect uh, on the on, on on the Israeli economy in general. It's a very very important investment, um, and um, and and you're investing a lot over there, and that's done by giving a lot of tax breaks. So the government is spending money in order to bring these firms in. Now, let's say I were to I were to change that. Let's say I were to not give the tax breaks to Intel. Let's say I were to, if I want to give tax breaks, give it in more standard type of, of manufacturing, okay, and, and not put it into the, into the high tech. The effect of that type of investment could be to stimulate the lower part of the economy. And if you stimulate the lower part of the economy, you give By it the, the lower part, you mean? The lo lower productivity part. Okay. Um, workers who, those 92%, who are never going to get an education in computers and become, you know, high tech people, but to do something, to get the training necessary to work in a middle level type of, of plant, well that's something that could be very, very significant. Because then you, uh, you, you lower income inequality really significantly inside the country. Uh, what's the effect on growth? I don't know. You know that could go in either direction, but, it could, but the dynamics become completely different. Yeah, it's certainly a dangerous matter to have the government try to kind of pick sectoral winners and decide which ones to subsidize you know, based on what's more high-tech or, or low-tech, low or based on what seems to have more kind of external effects on the rest of the economy, I think it's a very difficult matter to make that selection. 
So I was quite impressed by the talk we had a couple of days ago about noble energy. And, you know, the discoveries they've made in terms of natural gas uh, are phenomenal in terms of the magnitude. So, I mean, it was clear there that what you needed was not subsidy. You needed the government to stay out of the way and not to have a confiscatory tax burden on a, on a company like that that's uh, doing tremendous benefits for the economy. But it wasn't really a matter of them, I think, looking for subsidies as far as I understand it. That's right. So I, I want to take, take this in a slightly different direction, <clears throat> drawing off of what you just said, Avi, about inequality. And so I want to do another survey in the room. How many of you uh, either currently work in or expect to have a strong career in the so-called high-tech sector? Raise your hand. So a, a good chunk of you. How many of you consider yourself a so-called STEM worker, science, technology, engineering, or math? Raise your hand. So another good chunk of you. You're all at first-rate universities. You're very gifted. You're probably going to have a good life, even here in Israel, even if the government makes a lot of mistakes. I want to think about the people in the other 92%, right, who are not as easily going to find doors opening for them, and ask whether the education system in Israel right now is serving them well. So one of the puzzles is we hear in the United States, that these from our Israeli friends, that the Israeli educational system is not so great. How many people agree with that? I'm talking about K through 12, pre before university. How many people think it's it's not as effective as it could be? Come on, y'all should raise your hand. I mean, it's true of every school uh, in the world, public, private, or whatever. But the point is, is that there's a big question, right? And a lot of education takes place outside of school. So it's not surprising that the top 8% can overcome a mediocre or bad school system and still thrive because you can self-educate, you can learn from other people, you can learn on the job. But for a lot of people, that's not possible. So I want to ask the question of Avi, what is, are the potential reforms of the education system to help the 92% who aren't in high tech and to reduce some of the uh, feelings of resentment that I think are there? Okay, well, I'm, I'm going to actually object a little and say I don't think that the Israeli education is bad. Okay. I think it may have difficulties, it may have problems, and it may not always get, to, get you to where you want, but I don't think it's, it's, a, it's a bad education system. Um, a I lot will sleep better tonight. <laughs> well, that's good. I, uh, <laughs> that, that, was, that was my goal. Um, I, I, a lot of, of what needs to be done is already being done. Uh, there was a, a, a number of very important uh, agreements with teacher unions, uh, which raised the, uh, the salaries of teachers significantly, so that teachers are actually able to get a reasonable salary. What happened as a result of that is, not, is that the quantity and the quality of teaching inside of Israel has increased significantly. What I mean by that is that there are a lot of people who are, using te who are going to, into teaching as a second career. People are coming from high tech, and they're saying, you know what? I've made some nice money, I want to go and I want to give back. And they're going and they're taking out a teaching degree and becoming teachers. And this is having a, a, an effect on the, on the quality. Now we have to remember about the Israeli education system is that the number of children in Israel is huge. This is unlike any other country in the world. The, the, uh, the fertility rate in Israel is 3.08 children per family. It, it, the, there's no place else above 2.1, no developed country above 2.1. And 2.1 is you need to replicate yourself. Everybody else is below replication. It is also 3.08, and that's between, been between 3 and 3.1 for the past 25 years, 35 years. Um, so, so, uh, so, you know, to, to, to dump on the Israeli system, it faces a lot of difficulties, and I think it's actually moving forward. Well, that's good to know. Is it, isn't the fertility rate particularly a distributional thing, uh, especially in terms of the high rates for the ultra-Orthodox, which I thought is also... I was learning from you earlier, a big, the two big issues in terms of poverty problems I thought were ultra-Orthodox and in terms of Arab Israelis, which you described to me as uh, being two very different kinds of poverty problems. Right. So, so, I'll, so I'll give you the, um, the numbers. Um, in the past decade, the ultra-Orthodox, you're right, have much larger families than anybody else. In the past decade, the number of children per ultra-Orthodox family has gone down by a full child per family. Now, that's a lot. That's an incredibly large... They large just form. can't find them. 
<laughs> that may be on purpose, but they, they can't find that. Um, now, that sounds like a big fall, but it's fallen, you have to understand, from seven and a half children per family to six and a half children per family. That's a big difference. The, um, the uh, Arab Israeli population has also had a huge fall in the number of children they're, they, they're having, and they actually have fewer children per family now than the average. They're, they're uh, at about three, and it's on its way down. The, um, the, the, the population that's made that up is that the um, non-religious population is having more kids than they used to. And uh, they're at about 2.4 now. So that's actually increased. So you're right. You're right that a very, with, when, you, when you turn down to, to poverty, the, the larger problem is the, is the ultra-Orthodox. But it's also the Arab population. But the, the reasons for the poverty are very, very, very different between them. Um, in the, uh, with, with the ultra-Orthodox, what you have is you have the, uh, most of the men, at least in principle, preferring not to go out to the workforce and therefore they don't have much income. The women are the ones who are working, and that's only really happened since 2003 when child benefits were cut. And since then, there's been a large increase in, in, uh, in, um, in labor force participation, both of men uh, and women in, uh, from the ultra-Orthodox community. The Arab-Israeli community is in some ways the opposite. They also don't have a good education, just like the ultra-Orthodox don't, but they want to get out to the labor force. The men are almost all working, the women, more and more of them are working, but still a very, very low percentage. Uh, however, there the problems are that they don't necessarily, they want to work, but they don't necessarily want to leave their villages, or, they, uh, or maybe the husband doesn't want the wife to leave the village, or, and, and in addition, transportation was really, really bad. And if you, if you have bad infrastructure and you can't get to places of edu education, and you can't get to good places of work, then you're going to have this problem that you're going to be, have a lot, of, a lot of poverty. So the poverty exists very, very strongly in both of them, and those two populations make up well over half of the poverty inside the country, even though they're less than 30%, or about 30% of the population. So I lived in Israel uh, in 1971 uh, for eight months with my family, and the kind of things that Americans worried about when they came to Israel then was the quality of the peanut butter. The Americans, I thought it was embarrassing, but they, they, they complained that Israeli peanut butter wasn't very good. The only candy bar you could get was a Ngozi, which I think you can still get, right? I was a big fan of it, but that was kind of it. Well, then Coca-Cola came and people were very excited. And clearly over the last 40 years, there's been a huge change in the quality of consumer goods that are available to the Israeli economy. You can buy Skippy now. Yeah, yeah, life is good. Uh, can you get a chunky or just smooth? Do you know? Uh, you can get chunky. I mean, you can get, see? I mean, it's like you're like living. So, however, However, uh, having sent uh, three of my children here to spend a gap year, uh, I, I have this strange thing where they send me an email if I'm coming to visit, or they come to visit, they stock up on what? Not peanut butter, deodorant, shampoo. I'm thinking, what, 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 they don't have decent deodorant or shampoo in Israel. And they tell me, no, it's incredibly expensive. So my question is, how much of that is Meches and Mirsa, did I say that correctly? Thank you. Because uh, tariffs and quotas in English, how much of that is the fact that Israel makes it hard for competition to come from outside the country? And how much of it is a lack of competition within the retail sector that keeps uh, prices high? Uh, the answer is yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I was afraid okay. of. No, I'll, 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 I'll elaborate. Uh, I'll make it longer. Okay. Definitely yes. <laughs> no, okay, um, so, let, so, let me, so let me give you a little bit more. Um, Israel protects its, uh, its, um, its food producers, in particular, it's food. food producers. Yeah. Prices in Israel for food are very, very high. Now, prices in Israel for food have not always been very, very high. I can tell you when they became very high. They became very high in 2008. And what happened in 2008 is that there was, you probably, many of you, probably most of you don't remember this, but the, but the older ones here will remember that there were these sudden stories about emerging markets and about China becoming, suddenly starting to, to consume just like the, uh, the, the, uh, the East is consuming, and that, uh, like the West is consuming, sorry, and that, um, and that we're going to run out of food. You know, suddenly we're not going to have enough to produce. There were cover stories in Time and Newsweek uh, about the emerging markets. And if you take a look at, uh, at commodity costs, at the costs of, uh, of the, the things used to produce foods, 
they doubled and tripled within a, a very, very short period. Uh, after a few months, I can show you those, it's all pink sheet data. Uh, after a few months, it, it was realized that this was what we call much ado about nothing. The prices went back down to where they were uh, previously. Now what happens in the entire world is that the, the, the production prices went up. When the production prices went up, the, the producers raised their prices because they had no choice. They were spending so much more for their goods. When the production prices went back down, they lowered their, their prices back down. But that didn't happen in Israel. In Israel, the production prices went up, and they stayed high. And they stayed high for the other reasons you were saying. Yes, Israel's protecting, but because they're protecting, that means they don't have uh, much of the way of goods coming from abroad. Only about 12 to 15 percent of the, of the food goods was coming in, in from abroad. And, um, and, uh, and there were very few producers, because it's a small country, there weren't many producers of any good. So what you had was you had a typical situation of implicit collusion. You had a situation where something external raised prices, and I don't want to be the first one to lower my prices because I like that high price. So therefore, when prices go up, if you don't lower your prices, I'm not lowering my prices. And prices raised, uh, stayed high since then. And that's I what happened. I can't believe it can sustain like that without some kind of government support for that uh, situation in terms of uh, uh, limiting international yeah. trade and possibly competition in the retail sector, which I don't know enough about in terms of what that looks like. Right, so that's where I started. I started by saying that what they do is they limit trade. They, uh, they protect by having small, small quotas and by having tariffs and having a lot of non-trade barriers. And those cause uh, the amount of international of, of imports of food goods in particular. This isn't true in all in all goods. There's very very little tariffs in uh, in Israel. They were all pretty much abolished in in about 1990, but not in food. In food they were, and in food they remain, and the quotas remain. If earlier this year, or actually at the end of last year, there was what they call a new law passed. What they call what they like calling the cornflake law. The cornflake law basically the idea was to allow the import, free or import, of, of dried goods, like pastas and cornflakes and things along those lines, that's the right type of step. And that's where they're trying to go more and more. And then you, you of course, have the um, you know, people coming and, and saying, well, but what's going to happen to these firms? What's going to happen the, to the farmers? What's going to happen to et cetera, et cetera? How are we going to help them when you start allowing imports? And the answer that I always give it that answer is, if you, at, at that point, is, you know, if you really feel that there's a group you have to help, Subsidize them directly, and don't make the entire uh, uh, population pay for 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 protecting them. So it sounds like if there was a kind of sticky thing uh, going on, it wasn't really about prices. It was really about policy that was uh, maybe propelled by some initial uh, factor that showed up in prices, world prices. But then the thing that was sticky uh, and not allowed to go back down was about the government policies and supports, not about the market itself. Well, but I think it was also because there wasn't, well, I think you can look at it you know, either way, but you can say as follows. There was no place for the competition to come from. They, the government didn't allow the competition to come from abroad, and within the country there, were very, there are very few producers of every type. So that, of I mean, that's the central right. element, as I understand the story you're telling. Absolutely. Now, just to go back a moment, you were talking about fertility and poverty. So if I put that in a world context, you were talking about where was the high fertility and where was the poverty in, uh, in Israel and how they were re related. That's, I think, also true, actually, in a world context, because the, the one place in the world where the fertility rates haven't come down dramatically is actually sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, so people used to worry a lot about controlling population growth and particularly within big countries like China and India, and it's quite clear now that that's not an issue. Uh, but Africa is a different story, and that's also the place where, uh, quite uh, dominantly, that's where the poverty is now. Sub-Saharan Africa is the great bulk of the remaining poverty with the great success that was, uh, had occurred with the Asian countries, uh, notably, again, uh, China and India. And it's also somewhat related to the high fertility, but uh, that's not the only factor behind the uh, uh, poor economic performance in that region. So, so I'm going to ask, uh, we're, 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 I'm going to turn it over to questions uh, from the audience, but one last question for our, our two, uh, our two uh, panelists. 
a little bit of un an unfair question for Robert Barrow, who's a visitor to the country, and but I figured since well, why, he, why don't you just forget it? No, no, <laughs> no. I think you no. Know, I have this theory that see, Robert sat next to Abby at dinner, and they talked for about a half an hour, and he's been at the seminar for at least what three, two days now, two and a half days. So as an economist, he's now an expert on the Israeli economy. <laughs> so I don't think we really have anything to worry about. It, it, but you can pass if you want. My question is... I did not claim to be an expert <laughs> on the Israeli economy. I want to point that out. I'm going to take away your uh, union card. Um, my question is, we've talked about a whole bunch of different things tonight. It's been extremely interesting for me as a, another outsider who'd, who'd like to know more about the Israeli economy. It's been very educational to learn from Avi as well as from you out there as we've talked over the last couple of days uh, in the, in the uh, seminar has been fantastic. But my question is if you could do one thing, if you could cut through the red tape, you're, the, you're king for a day, you, you're a dictator, you can avoid the Knesset, you don't have to put together a coalition, and you can do one thing, and it can't be magic. Right? You can't say, my one thing would be to raise the productivity rate by 50%. You have to actually propose an imaginable policy that people would, could imagine happening. What might that be? So I want you to think. I could. So we could do kind of like a. Do you guys ever see Jeopardy in uh, here in, in in Israel? They have a little noise going for the final question. It goes dee dee dee. <laughs> so I, you may need a few seconds here to compose your thoughts, but I, I'd like to hear if you can. I, I'll let Avi go first since he's lived here longer. Uh, what would be the one thing you would do to try to improve, not just the growth, say, in the economy, but life and the opportunity for the Israeli people to flourish? The Freyot, the Sixuk, the things that we really ultimately care about as economists. I really liked your 50% thing, though. That was a good one. <laughs> if you could do that, that would be great. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, could, I could go back to the Haredi situation with respect to the ultra Orthodox, with respect to education, or with respect to, uh, to I mean, the infrastructure. That could, you can always go back there. I want to go somewhere else. Um, and, and this might be controversial, but I think it's important in any case. I think that the one thing that um, that needs to be that needs to change in Israel, which is very very significant, is um, is the the issue of the labor force, in particular unionization. Something we it passed through my mind a few minutes ago, and I let it <laughs> kind of go out through there. But yeah, it's right. a big thing. So so it com so it combines the two parts. Um, I have no problem with unions. But in Israel, there is one centralized union that basically, or one, one major centralized union, that basically controls too much. And it finds it too easy to, to it, the, 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 their finger is on the trigger much too easy. In other words, today there's discussion about the radio transmissions, what, who's going to be, uh, going to be broadcasting, and the, and, and, the, and the talk is we're going to shut down the entire economy. Now, this happens over and over and over again. And this threat is not just always an empty threat. It happens a lot that people just go out on strike for everything, and, and it could be for anything. And it could be something small that happens in one industry that then affects the entire economy. And there's no, and there's no, no nothing's barred. In other words, everybody can go on strike. So if you're an electric work, uh, work in the electric company, you can shut down electricity in the country. And you can shut down the ports into Israel, and you can shut down whatever you want to shut down. So, so it's so it's a two-part answer. I know I'm cheating a little bit, Sorry. but on the one hand, my one wish is for a lot of wishes. <laughs> right, there you go. <laughs> Nick say on the uh, <laughs> multiple wishes, right? Um, so, so my so 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 the point is, you know, having unions that are industry specific is logical for whatever reasons you might need them. But having a union that covers everything is, is not, it's certainly not in this setting. And having certain types of industries in which you are not allowed to strike, I think is essential. I don't think that every, every single industry should have the right to strike. I don't think it should necessarily be a right. Um, we remember what happened with Reagan, with the air traffic controllers. Oh, vividly. And, uh, and, uh, and that was basically when, uh, when the air traffic controllers went out on strike when they weren't allowed to, so then President Ronald Reagan said, you're not allowed to go out on, that, that, on strike. And they said, watch us. And he watched them, and then he brought in people from the Air Force in order to cover the airports, and fired every one of them, and they were not brought back into their jobs. And then they trained new people in order to take those, those positions. Um, I don't necessarily think that there should be a right to strike in any industry. 
uh, and that's uh, that's my feeling. Robert. Well, first I had some personal observations about being an expert in a particular economy <laughs> like Israel, which one doesn't really know a lot about. Uh, the truth is, I encounter this almost all the time when I go to some country. You know, I was recently, for example, in Bolivia, just to take a random uh, case. Uh, people there assume, to begin with, that I'm an expert on that economy. <laughs> like, uh, people in the media or business people. And so then, naturally, I feel I have to pretend like I am such an expert and try to do the best that I can. And I guess that also applies here, because I'm Maybe I know a little bit more about Israel than I do about Bolivia, but I'm certainly not an expert uh, uh, by any uh, uh, means. So Russ wanted me to come up with one prescription that I would recommend. So I wonder if I can get away with the general principle that you want to open up more to the market. Because if I give you a phrase like that, it really covers a lot of things. Uh, it covers openness to international trade, which we've already discussed in the context of food, for example, for uh, Israel. It also en uh, encompasses uh, diminishing regulations that make it hard to do business. That's another sense in which you're uh, opening up to the market. Uh, it would encompass uh, efficient taxation and uh, not confiscatory tra taxation, like in the case of uh, Noble Energy uh, here. It would also encompass fluid labor markets and some of the suggestions about uh, labor unions that were made. So I don't know if that really uh, means I get credit for just one thing. You get it all. <laughs> uh, but that, that's the way I would think about it. Now, I, I have a particular story about the labor market uh, regulation because certainly I'm sympathetic to the idea that uh, uh, monopoly of labor markets uh, on the side of uh, workers, for example, is going to hinder uh, economic uh, performance. But I wanted to mention one thing. We've already mentioned this World Bank Ease of Doing Business indicator, which has uh, started out in 2004, and I think is actually uh, a very good project, and I think it's very informative. Uh, but one of the interesting aspects of it is that it used to have, a, a, as one of its components, an indicator about the fluidity of labor markets. Uh, in particular, it included aspects of how easy is it to fire and hire uh, workers, um, which I would have thought was a really good indicator of uh, economic uh, policy that might matter for economic uh, growth. Uh, then around 2009, there was a lot of complaint about the fact that the World Bank had this uh, component of its ease of doing business and especially the International Labor Organization, which is basically a, uh, an association of labor unions, uh, complained to the World Bank about how it had this indicator that suggested that making it easy to fire workers was a good thing. And they didn't uh, agree with that sentiment, of course. So there was a big political fight at the, about, at the World Bank about whether to get rid of this project entirely and they ended up with this political compromise where they took the labor market indicator out of the main indicator that they now publish, but they didn't actually stop collecting the data. So you can still get their measures of uh, fluidity of labor markets, but it's not part of the main indicator, which we've already quoted for Israel about what it was, and no, it doesn't include the uh, labor market uh, measure. Uh, now, I have been looking at what seems to contribute to economic growth from this ease of doing business concept that the World Bank has put together. Uh, they have 10 main indicators, and it, it doesn't look like they're all the same. Some are more important than others in terms of contributing to economic growth. But one thing I did look at was this labor market indicator, which uh, has just been uh, suggested would be a really important uh, contributor to economic growth if you could relax the restrictions in the labor market. Uh, but I was quite surprised, actually, when I looked at that indicator, and this is certainly a preliminary finding, I did not actually find that it was important for economic growth. Uh, this is the one that had been dropped because of this political deal in 2009 from their index. Uh, I didn't actually find it to be important, and I'm not sure I understand why that's true, but that seemed to be what was in the, uh, uh, the data. Uh, of course, Russ doesn't like these kinds of data exercises. He doesn't like this kind of statistical work. 
uh, he probably doesn't like the specific finding. But uh, on the other hand, he'll probably just reject it because he, he'll say, well, that was just some of your statistical stuff, so I don't have to worry about that. Yeah, that, that was your magic wand, right? That was your, you know, just kind of, but I, seriously, what I, what I love about Robert Barrow, which is, he's honest, right? He didn't get the results he wanted, he didn't keep strangling the data until it screamed with the answer that his uh, priors uh, demanded. So I that, haven't finished yet. Yeah, that's true. Give him time. He did say it was preliminary, we look forward to the, to the published result. Uh, let's give our uh, panelists a hand, please. Thank them. Uh, it's pretty late, but maybe a couple of questions from the audience. Does anyone want to ask something? So uh, since um, I think what we'd li I'd like you to do is stand up, say your question with your regular voice, and I we'll try to repeat it uh, for the recording and also for other people who might not hear it on the other side of the room. So I'm convinced that um, government actions can decrease the group. But do you think that there are actions that they can do that would increase the, the group? That's a fantastic question. First of all, it's a question, not an alternative speech, which is always good. <laughs> Secondly, it was short, so we can try to repeat it successfully. And anyone else asking, I encourage that strategy. So the question was, we've talked about things that decrease growth. What can the government do to increase growth? I mean, I think the first point is that there are some basic functions of government which are really central to economic growth particularly in terms of establishing the basic rules of the game and setting up things like uh, rule of law. Uh, if you go back to the founding of the United States, I think it was quite central that we set up a, a well-functioning government with uh, uh, sensible basic uh, principles. Uh, Alexander Hamilton, who's a hero for many people, certainly thought at some points that the uh, government was not uh, centralized enough, that the central government didn't have enough power to carry out some of the basic functions. Uh, he was thinking about national defense, but also some uh, other issues. I think it's when you start deviating from the basic functions, which we can agree are really critical for economic progress, that then you get more and more questions in terms of the government uh, overextending what it's involved in. Uh, so you might want to extend some of these basic rule of law type things to things like providing a basic social safety net, that kind of a, a thing. But it's when you go too far that then you t tend to find a lot of things that uh, constrain economic growth. Well, I think probably in the Israeli context, uh, I, I guess I would say get out of the way. <laughs> that might help. The government would get out of the way a little. Look at it would uh, promote growth. You want to make, make a specific thing, or are you going to fall back? No, I, I'm, I, okay. Um, it's the market, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> um, it, you know, Israeli is, is, Israeli government is very, very active in, in cho choosing who it, who it gives uh, tax credits to, who it subsidizes, who it help, where where it invests, where it doesn't invest. You know, let the market work a lot more. I think in a lot of cases would be would be very helpful. Um, I, I think that, that there are things that the government does that are very good, and I think there are things that it does that are, that are, are less. Uh, so what, what proactive uh, things could the government take? If you try to look at where the government uh, should invest, where they should encourage people to invest, you know, and you want to go that way, then I would go with, the, with infrastructure again. I think that's probably the most important investment in Israel. But, but a lot of this, this thing, that, that stuff that I've been talking about, like with respect to getting everything into the hands of one group, to easing up the ease of doing business, then that, that means getting out of the way to a large extent and let things work. Next question. Yeah. Hi, Juan. Um, you mentioned before that uh, Israelis like to compare themselves to Scandinavian countries and, and call for social welfare, um, a welfare state. Um, and at the other, on the other side, they also complain all the time that taxes are so high and it's impossible. Um, and I want to ask if now that people are starting to form more of an opinion about the economy, um, how can we make them realize that the two come together? So the question is, uh, Israelis like the idea of comparing themselves to Scandinavia, but they're also worried about high taxes, which seems to be an inconsistency. And then, so the last part of the question was... I'm trying to figure out how we can convince people that you can't have one without the other. Right. How do we encourage people to realize that these are a trade-off and not something you can have simultaneously? I think if they just come to the institute, they'll they'll know that. 
<laughs> uh, no, but I, I really do think that, that you know, there is to some extent a, a self-contradictory in that, in that uh, we really are, tax rates, while well, people in Israel think tax rates are high, they're really not. They're really relatively low. And uh, your ability to give the types of service, in addition, of course, you have the military in Israel expenditure, which is much higher than in any of those other countries with respect to what percentage of what you're taking in you're using for military expenditures. And so you're starting at a point where you have about 24% of GDP in order to spend on all the different programs you want. And you want to give free education, and you want to give free health care, and you want to give um, you know, everything else that we want to give here, and, uh, and then you want more. And there, there really is uh, an issue uh, about how you can do all that. And it's difficult. It's a hard situation. No, there is a, a basic principle that the government has a, a budget constraint. So if it's going to want to provide more services or uh, social welfare benefits, it has to pay for that. So of course, the taxes are going to have to correspond uh, to the expenditure, even if not year by year in terms of some uh, longer term con context. Uh, it is true that you can raise the revenue that you're raising in a more or less efficient manner, and I think quite dramatically so. So a big political issue, I think, coming up in the United States will be, especially with regard to value-added taxes, which is the method that many, almost all countries have hit upon as a way to generate a tremendous amount of revenue uh, in a relatively efficient manner. Uh, the debate on that in the U.S. is precisely those aspects. Uh, it's more efficient, but being more efficient, it makes it easier for the government to become larger. And I think that's the particular reason that there's so much opposition to evaluate a tax in the US uh, among Republicans, because I think there's a valid concern that if you give the government in the US this powerful instrument, which is new in the US context, that part of the response will be to have more expenditures. And I don't know what the right answer is to that. It's a little hard as an economist, particularly if you think about public finance, to say uh, you should really have this inefficient tax system because then politically the government won't be too big. But it's, it's very uncomfortable to say I want a tax with bad properties. <laughs> yes? I'm going to ask maybe a not so technical question, but in short, to somebody that is starting his career in Israel, someone that is young, I think like many of the people here, economically, economically, would you suggest to stay in Israel? The suggest question is a, a, a very um, controversial question. Uh, if you're a young person, uh, do you recommend, uh, just on financial grounds, uh, should you stay in Israel or should you leave? This reminds me of a story. I had this great undergraduate student who actually wrote a published article with him. And he was trying to decide whether to do a PhD in economics or to go work for some big financial firm, which is, you know, you can think of analogs there about staying in Israel and not staying in uh, Israel. So one of my colleagues tells him, well, you can be a brilliant economist, so of course you should go do a PhD. Then another of my colleagues, who happens to be Ed Glazer, tells him, well, if you go work for this financial firm, you're going to contribute $300 million a year to the US economy. And frankly, that's more important than being another academic economy. And then he comes to me and asks me, well, what is my view about what he should do? And as usual, I take this laissez-faire approach. And I say, well, there are arguments on both sides. You know, there are benefits to being an academic economist if you love doing research and maybe you'll be really good at it, you'll contribute. On the other hand, I thought Ed's argument about the $300 million a year had some compelling aspects. And I told him, well, you're going to have to weigh those two things and then you decide what you uh, think is optimal. And I guess I would give the same advice to you or some other people what about did you do? Uh, <laughs> He went to work for Bain Capital. <laughs> so, I, well, well, I'll let you answer that. If I you want me to. Yeah, I, do you want to answer? You know, well, first of all, if you stay, then because everybody else is leaving, you, you'll have a lot more income. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, 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 but seriously, you know, Robert's answer is, is, clear, is clearly the correct one. You know, it depends. If all that, that, that's important to you is where will I make the highest income or have the highest standard of living, 
you know, if you can uh, get, you know, go go to the states, you'll you you have a good chance of doing better than you'll do here. Um, I I think that there's probably a lot more uh, th at stake than just that. Well, I, I just want to say uh, two things. One, I think every all three of us here deliberately chose careers that were less lucrative. That is, that paid less than our than alternatives that we had that were legal. <laughs> <laughs> We chose to take the job that was more meaningful, more satisfying, and that paid less. And I don't think anyone on this panel and the other academics that are scattered in the crowd here has a moment of regret in giving up money in return for more uh, meaning. So my general advice when students ask me is to, is to remind them that it's fun to make a big salary. It's fun to you feel important. Uh, and if you let other people know about it, you can feel more important than they are in their eyes, too, which is sometimes a human failing that we are all prone to, to invite envy and have pride and to s and enjoy our status. So there's a natural tendency to say, if I could make X dollars more somewhere else, obviously I'll feel better, I'll be happier. But if we've one learned one thing in the history of humanity, and one thing that economics remembers, even though people think it doesn't, is that money isn't everything. So, sure, money matters, but go to where you will flourish in every sense of the word and not just the money side. That would be my advice to every human being facing these kind of choices. Do we time up one more question, Bob, or should we? It's uh, maybe one more question before we uh, give people a chance to socialize, or do you, yeah, last one. Uh, you mentioned China before, and I wonder, um, as an East Asia Studies uh, student, what do you think regarding China? Do you think it can improve the Israeli economy, or maybe it's a Trojan horse? I don't know, but I would like to hear your opinion regarding that. You're talking about the increased relationship between ch the Chinese and the Israeli economy? The new agreement, so just uh, Commercial, whatever. Yep. So, the question is whether that's good for the Israeli economy. You know, I, in general, I've been a great fan of China's transition from the late 1970s onward, where it moved away from a serious communist system to something that was more and more approaching the market. And it looked for a long time like they were gradually improving their various uh, institutions, uh, economic, legal institutions, and it looked for a while like even in terms of something that looked like it was going to increase in terms of political democracy was going to be relevant. They seem to have stopped a lot of that. Um, I think currently China looks much less promising in those, re in those respects in terms of further kind of institutional development. Um, I think the rate of economic growth is going to be diminishing quite dramatically from where it's been, which is in some ways the world's greatest achievement since around 1980 or so. Um, but I'm less optimistic about it as an economic powerhouse going forward than I would have been uh, some time ago. And then they have a lot of specific issues, uh, rural urban uh, issues, financial market issues, uh, which are question marks. Um, now that doesn't mean Israel shouldn't have relations with China and uh, interactions. But uh, I'm less uh, favorable toward where China seems to be moving now than I would have been, uh, say, 10 years ago uh, or, or so. I think close this up. Close it up. My, my take on the, on the recent agreements is that they, uh, they at least potentially have a, a lot of uh, uh, promise. I don't know where it's going to lead, but it does open up a, a lot of ability for uh, a possibility. For, for some significant trade with, uh, with China, for a significant amount of investment in the Israeli economy coming from there. And those are things that could help to, to push the Israeli economy forward. In other words, a lot of the closing of the European markets and the American markets in terms of, uh, of exports can be, can be made up by this huge economy. And some of these free trade agreements <coughs> can, ha can have that effect <coughs> Excuse me, because there are a lot of things that Israel produces that, that uh, would be very benefit of great benefit to, to China. So if I think it does have a lot of potential, how it will play out, I don't know. I should also add, in the U.S. context, 
there's a tendency for the current U.S. administration to blame China for all sorts of things. Yeah. As, as so the uh, U.S. economy has been greatly harmed by the trade with uh, China. And the truth of the matter is we've gotten all these products that are reasonably good quality at low prices for a long time. And it's hard to make any serious case about why that's harmful to the United States. And you can think about the limit of that. Uh, suppose a country wants to give you all their stuff for free. And then are you supposed to say no because it's dumping or the prices are too low? I mean, that can't possibly be uh, uh, correct. Now, I think it would be even better if China opened up more in terms of its own uh, uh, buying from abroad and in terms of being more hospitable to business and even to their own businesses operating uh, uh, abroad. So I think there's, that would also be good. But I'm certainly worried about the, uh, the U.S. stance toward China, which I think is a little bit uh, dangerous, actually. Well, before we close off, I just want to say one thing. First of all, thank you all for, 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 for being here. But second of all, um, I, we, I invite you all to take a look at the things that we do at the Top Center. We have a lot of really interesting uh, research. All of our materials are free online and can be also be gotten in, in hard copies for free. Um, and uh, and we love to hear from people who read our, our materials and have comments and uh, get back to us about what we're doing uh, because we, we learn from it. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody.